Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, where it's our goal to help you become the best financial advisor possible and drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor crew and I'm super pumped to be introducing this brand new series we're about to kick off all around the three P's of Plan Produce Profit. Now, the uh, the XY team has spent a lot of time thinking about what makes a great financial advice offering, a great financial advice business and what we distilled it down to was that there are three key elements that you need to get right to, to have any level of success in your financial planning business. The first is about planning and how to plan an epic service proposition that's engaging for the people that you want to work with and compelling to drive real results within your business. The second is about producing and that's about being efficient in your business, streamlining things, uh, being you know maximizing the benefits of technology to uh, run a, a scalable and uh, profitable advice service. And then the third is profit, which is all about getting your message out to a bigger market uh, how how do you attract more people into this awesome offer that you're running efficiently and scalably so uh, I'm taking over over the next 15 episodes we're gonna have 15 advisors with me hundred percent advisors uh, I've had a bunch of fun with the recordings that I've done so far the interviews and uh, and I've got a few more great ones to come so uh, I hope you enjoy this series as you scale your advice business, are you frustrated with the amount of compliance, paperwork, and staffing issues? Virtual Business Partners specializes in helping financial services firms in four areas, admin, power planning, bookkeeping, and marketing. Virtual Business Partners work with you to get your business offshore ready. This includes identifying what tasks need to be done locally and what functions can be managed offshore. Advisors find they can reduce back office costs by between 50 and 75% and significantly improve their task turnaround times. For more information, go to virtualbusinesspartners.com.au. Well, uh, Fox Sports hair aka a- 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 <laughs> jess and jess and glenn <laughs> guys uh thanks thanks for joining me today uh for the plan produce profit series uh and today we're talking all about planning your business so i appreciate you taking the time uh got a couple of rapid fire ones for the people in the audience that don't know you already mm-hmm. so uh what does what's your ideal client uh, someone young professional age between kind of 25 45 cool and what's your uh, what's your offer? Um, to help our clients achieve their goals. Great. Team? Team. How many in the team? Yep. Jess and I, and then two support staff. Right. Uh, a number of clients? <laughs> yeah. Me? My turn. Um, we have 111 yep. clients. Well, okay. Um, should have asked you if I could ask this one before. Can we ask revenue? Band? Banding? Um, upfront or ongoing? Of your business? Uh, of, of a business. Uh, so we've just ticked over the half a million dollar mark. So tell us, uh, tell us, oh, for, uh, my other question is time. How much time do you spend working on your business? How many hours in the week? On the business or in the business? Total, how many hours do you work a week? Uh, I would work about 70 to 75. No, he wouldn't. He would work <laughs> like 95. No. We work We work six days predominantly a week. Um, so we work Saturdays as well, which is probably a bit different to most With other clients. clients as well, right? And yeah. yeah we think, that is bold. Yeah. It's, it's actually really good. In terms of like Glenn and I have lots of conversations about this. Um, if, if you're a business owner, all the days of the week don't really matter. Like mm. if you can work a Saturday and then take a Tuesday off, why is that a big deal? I guess it becomes more complicated if you've got kids and family commitments and stuff, which we don't have. So that's mm. kind of mitigating that um, situation. But clients love it. They really do yeah. because they're chilled. Firstly, they're together. They haven't been stressed out all day. Um, so, yeah, so we work predominantly six days a week. So, look, we don't know how many hours we work. We work quite a bit. Yeah. I, uh, I, I like the – like I often work on the weekend. But I like the weekends to clear my workload, not mm. to do more work that creates additional work. So I mm. tend to stay away from the client stuff on the weekends. Yeah. So what we do, so I like for me, I usually block out most Wednesdays. 
because that's and that's where I clear my work mm. um, because it's more for me to see the clients on a Saturday for them. And I don't see clients on a Monday. Cool. Very we do have aspirations that, though yeah. to um, to go down to five days a week. That's a business goal for us. Um, but in terms of what that day we take off, it might be a Monday or a Tuesday or something like that. Um, so Saturdays just seems really popular. Mm. Cool. And uh, sorry, the other question is, uh, how long has your business been going for? Just over 18 months. 18 months. Yeah, we launched in October 2017. Cool. With yeah. no clients, none. Cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Starting from scratch. Love that. Did the same thing uh, when I started Pivot World. So uh, that's a that's amazing. A uh, hundred plus clients, uh, half a million bucks, eighteen months. It's uh, well done. Well done, team. Thank, Thank you. you. So tell us tell us a bit about that journey, the background, and and how you've ended up where you are today. Sure. So Glenn and I both worked at Macquarie Bank together and why we had different roles, but we had the same clients. So our clients were financial advisors and we did quite a few road trips. Out to Dubbo and Orange yeah. and all that. You get to know each other. <laughs> I mean, you're in a car, you're trapped in a confined space for a pretty yeah. long period of time. And to be perfectly frank, we were having conversations about the fact that we couldn't see younger clients being serviced by traditional advice models. And we felt that there was a really strong need to offer more diversity in who gives and who gets advice. And so for about two and a bit years, we were working on Fox and Hair before we launched and it just gave us a tremendous amount of time and opportunity to really think about, you know, who do we want to be as an organisation and how do we want to help our clients? And we really developed that um, pre-launch. So we didn't kind of open the door October 2017 and then try to work out what the hell we were going to deliver. And we really spent a lot of time strategically thinking about what, does the business look like and how we're going to work with people moving forward? Yeah. Yeah, look, I love that. I think, you know, today, like one of the things that we've found with the XY group is that there are these, you know, planning an epic service proposition that's compelling to your ideal customer uh, is, a, is a really a cornerstone to any successful advice practice uh, as well. So, uh, but I think just for the for people listening that aren't familiar with you guys, probably worth one thing that you sort of just quickly rush through there is that uh, you guys work in Macquarie, as uh, on the product side, on the other side of the fence. So yeah. when you started your business just 18 months ago, there was no, you had not been advisors before, you had not run an advice business before, you had not created a statement of advice, nope. financial plan. No, nope. uh, I'm giggling. Yeah, no, we hadn't done any of those things. So bold, bold move. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was, it was um, pretty, pretty, it's been a pretty steep learning curve, but um Enjoyable along the way. I think there's something quite nice about not knowing. Like, I'm not sure if yeah. you know what you're getting yourself into. Mm. Like, you've got to be pretty crazy to, to to really, if you've really understood what, what endeavour you're taking on and what that will take. Like, my best analogy is I think it's like having a newborn. Like, you know what having a baby is going to be like, but you do not know what having mm. a baby is going to be like until you have a baby. Mm. I was going to use that same analogy as someone that's, uh, that's just about to have their first kid. It's like I've seen babies before. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, it, but, yes. Yeah, so that's, that's learning curve. <laughs> <laughs> that learning curve that you're about to experience, this is how we have felt for the last mm. 18 months. And mm. it genuinely feels like a newborn. Mm. Like it literally keeps me awake at night. Uh, you know, if you don't if you don't look after it, you you can really see that it needs a lot of attention and care. Mm. Um, and, yeah, it's it's been a long 18 months, but it's been an amazing and strange, like small business is so, so different to corporate. And when you've worked in corporate for such a long time, you really forget that small business, you spin so many plates. I mean, Glenn's laptop is perpetually dying. I'm anyway. a regular at the Genius Bar at Apple because, I don't know, something's wrong with the hard drive. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, yeah. so like I just... See, make an email signature. I know that me, like when I started my yeah. business... It's like, fuck, what? You mean who, I could have do that? And then yeah. it's like, how do you get the little picture in there? Yeah. And then get the little picture to not like go Be away. all like weird format. Yeah. yeah you guys have gone one, one, one level further though because you have like flashing pictures yeah. and multiple pictures in the same picture. Yes. So, so well done. Clearly <laughs> the genius bar. That time at the genius bar is fun. It's fading up, yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, there are so many resources that you completely take for granted in yeah. um, a large organisation and even just the um, logistics that you take on as a small business owner, particularly when you've never given advice before. Yeah. 
Yeah, and you guys have got it from both sides because, like, uh, like I had written a heap of financial plans when I started my business, but a business, as you mentioned, is its whole it's its whole uh, own sort of learning curve. And then you've got trying to, you know, be a confident financial advisor. You picked a, um, well, I'd say interesting times. I feel like they're all interesting times for Mm. the last sort of almost decade in in the financial advice space, but Mm. a lot of change and, um, Mm. you know, on the advice and and making sure that we're we're doing the right thing, but also that everything's consistent with the, you know, myriad sort of laws that they they throw at us. Um, Mm as well so uh how did you guys negotiate that and and what it has have one of you sort of taken more charge in clearly you're the it guy but like from a, if you think about business and advice or has that been a journey that you've very much gone on together no definitely gone on together so we've actually we've got i suppose as a corporate has kind of different business units you've got marketing it hr um or all of you know uh, I guess, finance, all of that kind of area. We've actually split those roles between Jess and I. So I do look after kind of the IT component. So if something breaks, I'm at the Genius Bar or at JB Hi-Fi or whatever the case may be. Whereas on the HR side, um, because we have hired a couple of people um, over the last kind of six to eight months, Jess is speaking with the lawyers around how to get a, you know, a, a the, the contract, the employment contract mm. in place. Yeah. Um, so we've, spl- we've split it that way. So it doesn't necessarily mean that Jess does all the HR or I do all the IT, but it means that um, one of us takes ownership over that kind of uh, business. Mm. Um, so that was actually something that was recommended to us from a business coach yeah. that we saw really early days. And it was around making sure that you're um, not doubling up. Mm. So you create efficiencies if you know mm. whose role something is even from the outset just really segregating those roles makes sense but also you know position those um roles with the person that's going to enjoy or naturally be better at those sort of roles as well so you would never have me as you had a head of it Mm. it just not is a role that i'm very capable of and so i think that you know doing that really early on also helped the team know that if they had specific questions they knew what to go to glenn to Mm. for and what to come to me for which is good yeah very good. And so we just did our employment contracts recently as well. Mm-hmm. The lady was asking me what our dress code was. Do you have a dress code in your employment contracts? I don't you know, think so. It's funny. People have asked us in our interviews what the dress code is. In fact, yeah. Charlotte from our team was talking about this the other day um, and I suggested <laughs> to her in the interview it was pretty casual and she reminded me that I actually had a jumper on with a panda on the front of it. So she knew pretty early on that yeah. pretty cash. Mm. Um, I think we've just said in interviews that we want people to be cash but professional, but we've never put in our contract. Mm. Yeah. Like Common the, sense approach. I just started laughing when <laughs> the lady asked me. but no. uh, yeah. Haven't had to deal with that yet. But maybe there's something that we'll add in in the future if we need to. Don't know. I think you've got maternity leave though. Three months paid for any, uh, you know, aspiring power planners out there that want to, you know, get in and then just like <laughs> throw off a uh, maternity <laughs> leave bomb. Please don't do that. Yeah, that's not really what we're thinking about. But in all seriousness, like Glenn and I um, set to build a business that is amazing to work you know, from a client perspective to work with clients, but we want a team that love working with us and that, you know, really are proud to say that they work for Fox and Hair and we want to give them stuff that's outside of just paying them their salary. And we do a whole heap of cool things and that's continually pivoting. But, you know, I think as a modern business, like you can't just expect to hire Mm. people and pay them a salary and that that's enough. That's not enough anymore. Mm. What if you marry them though? Is that? That's an added layer of complexity. (laughs) You've taken a unique approach. Luckily for Glenn and I, that's not going to be um, a thing we've been to to consider. And um, yeah, we haven't considered that at all, actually. Right. I think there's a there's a Richard Branson quote that um, talks to you know look after look your staff your number one priority because you Mm. look after your staff and that look after your clients. Yeah. Um, So we've really really embraced that. Sure. And so you're mucking up my order a little bit, but team is definitely one of the questions that, that I had on my list because yeah. one of the learnings for me personally is that you can't you can't build a great business without a great team. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. It does really, I, I battled at it for like two full, like I did it myself for a year, then I brought Yang, who's now my wife, into the business for another year, the two of us, and we tried to not expand the team beyond that. And it's really, it constrains growth. You can't do it all yourself. You, you end up limiting your potential to serve. Uh, you know the, the 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 market. So, what do you you know? How have you approached the team? What have been the key sort of lessons that that you've learned there? 
Mm, in terms of the hiring process, yeah, building your team over time. What? Did, how did you go about it? Like, what was the what was the progression in terms of the people that you hired and the roles that you hired for? Um, so interesting. So we did we did have a little. Um, uh, you know, we've. It's not been the easiest, and it comes with its challenges because this isn't something that that, that Jess and I. No, like we've, been, we've never done it before. We've worked for, for corporates sure. that have yeah. huge, you know, um, you know, huge HR teams. But mm. we have gone down the path of, um, you know, looking at um, working with recruiters, mm. uh, which which I think has been been quite successful. Um, also, getting them to do psychometric tests again, not to you know understand their you know financial literacy or you know whether they want to go to a party or read a book, those kinds of questions, but more around how aligned are they to the role that we're hiring for mm. um, and also just making sure that they fit from a cultural perspective, mm. whereas there's only four of us in the office, yeah. um, you know, if they're not on board from a cultural perspective and, you know, understand our values and are aligned with our values, then it's probably not going to work. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the most important thing really, that uh, we need someone that's going to enjoy the role. But for me, I find that the values and that alignment, if you've got someone that generally you guys have set your um, your business values and there be, you know, like aligned to your personal values where you work hard and you mm-hmm. do the right thing and you look after people and uh, all of those sorts of things. So if you find, and I've, I've hired poorly in, in the past, especially when I first started the company, um, trying a couple of different things and you, you just end up, you try, you're fighting an uphill battle because the person just, it just doesn't have that alignment. And I think mm-hmm. it's one of the biggest lessons for me is if you find that person, then, you know, you, and you're higher on capability that people can learn. It's not rocket science. Like there's, there's difficult elements to the role, but mm. if you've got that alignment and people in place, then mm. uh, you, you can, you know, I suppose mm. ha- have that, have that and get to the, get to where you want to do. Yeah. And it's such a, it's such a painful lesson to learn. Mm. And as a small business mm-hmm. owner and a new advisor and someone who is trying to, you know, the learning trajectory is strong. You know, if you've never had to do this before and you make a wrong hire, you know, that's a that's a really, really big impact across multiple areas of the business. And, you know, my, my big takeout from all of it was around, you know, to Glenn's point, really understand the role that someone is going to work, you know, well in in that role. And are they going to grow out of that role? Are they going to want to move on fairly quickly and do you have the capabilities to support that growth? Because if you don't, then you shouldn't hire someone who's super ambitious for yeah. that role either. And then train them, like really onboard them. Like small businesses are so good at, you know, just throwing people into the role and you're just setting everyone up for failure because how are you meant to, you know, if you go to a big corporate, you've got big inductions and you've got, you know, big training mm. and we learned the hard way that you actually need to invest a significant amount of time in training schedules and training plans because, you're really not setting up your new starter to feel like they're getting themselves into the role well either. Yeah, definitely. And I think clear expectations, that's what something that I've learned is the is the most important thing. Like KPIs from a from a day-to-day yeah. perspective, but expectations are saying, you know, these are the core things of the role. These are the things that you absolutely have to do. And uh, th- these are the things that you absolutely cannot do. Yeah. And if that happens, if the, this doesn't happen or if this does happen, then this is a major problem. And then just, just, uh, super sort of ruthless with, with, with that working towards it. I found I got through our business coach, got onto a book by Keith Cunningham, The Road Less Stupid, mm. fantastic book if, uh, if you haven't read it already. But he talks a lot about a lot of the lessons that Keith Cunningham is um, the original, the real rich dad, poor dad, long right. story, which I, I won't go there on uh, on the record for. But um, he it talks about he's built multiple multi-million and maybe even billion dollar businesses out, out of the States and uh, he talks about a lot about hiring the lessons around that, and uh, yeah, just just having an, and I've 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 used some of the uh, words of like straight out of his book, put them into our hiring manual to say, you know, this is the um, the role is part of the job. Like you can't you can't have the job if you can't do the role, and mm. so the expectations of that you're the only person that can fire yourself. This is how you can fire yourself. Mm. If you, but if you do that, then if you don't do that, or you do do what you're supposed to do then you do that and I think what I found is that I felt like a bit of a dick when I first put it in there because I'm like I, I you know like I'll have tough conversations when I uh, when I need to but you don't want to be that you want to have a you know fun and inclusive environment for mm. your team and stuff but uh, I found that that 
yeah, like you, people like to have that clarity to say, well, these are the expectations and they go, great. I just do the, what's expected of me. And then I know I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. So yeah. Uh, Can I build on that just slightly? We've actually just reset KPIs. We went for them yesterday for the new financial year. And I think there's a couple of parts to that. So, you know, you've been talking a lot about kind of KPIs for the role, which I think is really important because then it helps the team as well understand what success looks like for them. Um, but I think beyond that, like one thing that we did earlier this year, which was quite interesting, was we did a team offsite. And we actually discussed as a business what, um, I guess, what our business expectations are of each other. And so we set like a fox and hare family doc, like how if you're going to work in at fox and hare, what does working at fox and hare actually look like? And we all made commitments within that document around how we show up um, every day to come to work. And I think that the benefit of doing that as a team is, you know, it's not Glenn and I talking down to the team and saying, you know, you must do this and we expect mm. you to do this. Mm. It was all of us saying we will hold each other all accountable if we don't stick to the values that we've mm. set as a team are really important. And I think that we're going to do that every year as the team expands because I think it's a really inclusive way of making sure everyone understands not only their role and the KPIs, but just how stuff works around here and what we're committing to as a team to help each other. Yeah, great. I love that. That's good. I'm actually I'm making mental notes as we talk here <laughs> offside. Yeah, uh, yes. and we well, share our KPIs. So Jess and I have KPIs, and on a weekly basis, mm. um, as does the team, we, we all talk about our specific KPIs, challenges that we're facing, mm. um, you know, things that are going well, things that we can improve on. Mm. Um, Love okay. it. Because yeah. yes, we're a team. It's, yeah. it's not just us. And we sure. have to be honest in being vulnerable. Like I think in yeah. big business particularly, but mm. maybe even maybe more so at Macquarie, like, there's no sense of vulnerability. If you're vulnerable or if something's not yeah. working, you are covering that up or you're good thanks, everything's yeah. going well. Like in a small team, we really want people to be honest and say like, it's okay, you can put your hand up if there's too much work or like I have been, you know, known to say, guys, I haven't been able to get through all this this week. Here's how I need to reprioritize. Mm. Like, we just need to teach teams to be better communicators and that vulnerability is okay. Yeah. Because covering it up is only going to last so long. Mm. I agree. And I think it's one of the things that you do, you know, there's more talk about doing it from a business perspective. And, and I think that that authenticity and vulnerability is something that it's a way to build, build good connections with, with our uh, market, potential clients, clients. Right. But it's, yeah, you, you're right. I think that, that, that it applies the same to, mm. to the team. And I think we've all been a bit shit at that. Yeah. As a as a as a profession, I don't think we're being very good at being vulnerable. I think there's some really good conversations starting to happen. Yeah, mm. definitely. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's like it's a, it's a big shift. What's happening? Yeah, mm. yeah. Awesome. Cool. So, look, I'm keen to talk about planning because I know that you guys did a few things that were were a little sort of uh, well had been used in other industries, but not so much in the financial advice space. So, tell us a bit about the journey of how you planned out what your what your service was going to be, what it was going to include and not include, the results you were going to deliver. How did you How did you go about building that? Mm. I might let Glenn answer this, but can I just say um, I was very fortunate in that I chose a business partner who is the most structured, <laughs> the most organised, the biggest plan no, um, person there so is. Like loves a plan. <laughs> um, so if you want to talk about kind of the journey that we went on. Yeah, it was this constant, um, I won't call it battle, but between Jess and I and all our amazing ideas and then me trying to work out how we're actually going to deliver on this. Um, but so probably for about two and a half years before we launched, Jess, Jess and I caught up pretty much weekly talking about the two two kind of areas that we focused on, I think, when, when planning was client experience um, and and also building networks because we weren't going to kind of kind of buy a book and we'll literally start it from scratch. So we had to kind of build a bit of a pipeline. Um, the area we didn't focus as much on and we probably should have was probably just the actual logistics around running an advice business, mm. drafting the SOA and all of that kind of yeah. kind of stuff. So we're very focused on on, on client experience. Um, in terms of what what we did, we, we kind of took took a step back and thought about um, you know how would the client want to feel um, coming on as a client of Fox, or a prospect coming on as a client of Fox and Hair. Um, so from that very first meeting, how would we want them to walk away from that meeting feeling mm-hmm. um, when we when they come in when they sign on as a client. You know, and they come to that next session starting to kind of workshop ideas around strategies and things like that. Again, it was very much focused on, again, how would we want them to feel 
af after that session and what we would want them to, to get out of it. Um, we, in terms of how we did that, um, acknowledging that everyone has very different levels of um, financial literacy. We spend a lot of time with our clients on and we've built kind of education packs, which we're constantly kind of evolving, right. um, but working through, again, how can we ensure that we, when we do get to the, the, sta uh, the statement of advice, when we actually deliver that document that they understand, you know, what a managed fund is, or you know, what what what's, what insurance they currently have before we recommend any other different type of insurance and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, and in terms of, I suppose, again, not just relying on Jess and I and how uh, you know what we thought people want, we did spend some time and hosted a number of focus groups. Um, before before we launched, um, and this was re this was to really um, share with you know a room full of people that would have been our ideal client, and, and a number of them have actually come on as clients. Yeah. But, Interesting marketing strategy. Yeah, <laughs> um, sharing with them re and being really really vulnerable and saying this is this is what we're thinking, and to be honest, getting them to rip it apart mm. and say, oh, I get that, I don't really understand that oh, this sounds really good, but have you considered that? And we specifically picked people that, you know, weren't within the financial services industry, um, weren't direct friends of Jess, or I, mm. Jess and I, and we also um, outsourced the facilitation so that Jess and I were kind of, um, you know, leading, leading their answers. Yeah. Um, I think the only thing I would add to that is I think one of the advantages of us and our business is we've got a pretty um, niche and so we looked at for a long time around who is the client that we feel we can best serve and what problems do those clients have and how can we help solve their problems. Yeah. I think for the, the average financial advice business who is dealing with kind of pre-retirees all the way down to kind of the 25-year-old kids or grandkids, like th that is actually quite a challenge of really understanding all the diverse challenges mm -hmm. that those clients have for sure, yeah. and what's the customer experience for each of them. Mm. And I and I really believe that if you have a one-size-fits-all model, if you do have a big business like that in terms of the client ages, I actually don't think you would you would be able to meet the feeling expectation that the client has. Mm, for all of them, yeah. So I think the fact that we've got quite a niche client base has really meant that we can very much narrow our focus in mm. terms of that journey yeah. and that education um, because the problems that our clients are having, whilst they are real mm. problems, you know, there's only a handful of them. Yeah, really. absolutely. Yeah, I know that that's something that I've found in my business that we, you know, work with in a sort of fairly similar uh, space mm. and it's that's allowed me to yeah to think through the problems what are the frustrations what are the challenges what are the solutions what are we going to deliver yeah uh and then come up with this crisp marketing message which i know you guys have, have got that uh, as well that actually gets cut through but mm. uh we do work with a range of different people and sometimes like now i've got these uh, a lot of younger people and we're helping their parents. It's like this reverse weird thing that like mm. our financial advice has worked in the mm. past where the parents, where the, where the kids are going, you know, people in their early thirties are going, well, I'm, you know, working hard to make sure that I'm financially secure and I've got money. My concern is that my, if my folks aren't financially responsible, that they're going to, then I'm going to have to support them and yeah. then it's going to drag down the results that I get. And uh, it ends up, you know, being a pretty serious concern. So especially for someone that's, that's comfortable or like, or, you know, wealthy, they don't want to, they don't want to be wealthy while their parents are struggling. So yeah. it's like, it sort of makes sense that they would want to help them. But when we, I, what I've found is that when we help the, when we help the, the parents, it's a total different ball game. Totally. We can explain that we can we can explain the service in a way that connects because the, they all want the same results. Yeah. But how you get there, and then we have to we're shifting our processes, and they won't use Dropbox, and mm. they uh, they struggle with the video conferencing. They yeah. want to come in for all the meetings, which I don't mind, but it, it it is a total different thing, and it definitely takes us a lot more time. So I don't know how people do it. One, getting cut through, I think, would be impossible from a business perspective, but also just the efficiencies. It's like you need to run a, you know, 30s and 40s business versus a 60s and 50s and 60s business versus a business owner business. Again, it's all mm. it's all sort of different challenges. So I think that's interesting. So tell me, when you say you thought through the, 
the problems and the challenges and the frustrations for the people that you wanted to help. Mm. How did you how did you go about doing that? Yeah, so I think I think what was interesting out of those focus groups was actually our first focus group was all around how do you feel about financial advice? Mm. And what we found really upfront was that our ideal client does not think that they need financial advice. So there yeah, were kind of two sets totally. of problems and challenges here. So the first one was around this perception that you've got to be wealthy to get advice, mm. that advice is for old, rich, white men because that's <laughs> really who it's yeah. being marketed to um, and that they, that they didn't know what value they were getting from for the fee. Mm. So there was all these kind of barriers to entry around understanding, okay, well, at least we know eyes wide open why clients may not want or why people may not want to come on as a client. How are we going to look to solve those problems? So that's around education, around how starting early can make such a significant difference, um, what financial advice can mean for someone if you're not wealthy. You know, we've tried to make sure that in all of our content that we were delivering, we were really trying to educate people around those barriers mm. and then talking about the specific, because I see those as, as problems because if you're not going to get advice because you don't think you need it or you don't think you've got mm. enough money for it, yeah. that in itself is a problem that we have to deal with. And then for those people that did come on as clients, we have to really understand, okay, well, what are the financial impacts of all of these things? So having a baby, cool, that's a really common goal for a lot of our clients. Mm-hmm. What does that actually mean? Mm. What tools do we need to think about? What you know, education content can we produce that's really specific for that goal? You're probably quite interested in I've got in a that. spreadsheet now. I've got Yang. Every time we do something, I'm like, put that in the spreadsheet because then we can give it to the clients and then we've got the cheat sheet. So yeah. I joke yeah. around with all the clients. I'm like, I'm blazing the trail for you guys. Just, you know, we're trying to take our customer service <laughs> yeah. to the next that's level so yeah. that when you're, when you're ready, we're going to lay it all up. Yeah, well, if you're intending on sending your new baby to the private school, I'm sure that there's some really interesting stuff. So, you know, we've yeah, looked at all we've got a spreadsheet for that. We've got a for that. So we've looked at kind of the, the challenge or the, the opportunity that, or the goal and then really started to think, okay, cool, from a financial sense, what do we need to make sure we're asking and what do we need to start helping clients factor in? And so just because we aren't, you know, quite niche in terms of the age range, we've looked at the most common goals starting a business, starting a family, upgrading property, get taking on debt. You know, we've really tried to um, put education content around that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that, you know, 90% of the goals would probably fit within sort of the education framework that we've created. Yeah. And as Glenn said, we're constantly evolving it and certainly not perfect, but it just means that um, we can pivot the content based on the right kind of yeah. challenge or opportunity to discuss with the client. And is that, is that for attraction though? Is that for new potential client attraction or is that for you, once you've engaged a client, then you're going, okay, well, here's the Both. stuff. Yeah. yeah. I think the whole part around why you should get advice and, and why that makes sense when you're early, like that's definitely to the broader yeah. market. Yeah. Um, but yeah, to Glenn's point, you know, both, definitely both. The conversations that we have for clients though are significantly more in depth. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, kind of thinking about the, the planning stage and also, you know, how we, how we kind of developed this, um, we just spent a lot of time trying to, you know, answer as many questions as we thought, um, would come out in the conversations. And then so that when we, and we've got kind of a, a, on our, on, on our, um, SharePoint, we've got a list of kind of resources and when particular, you know, issues come up, we've got resources that we can give, give Mm. to our clients, um, whatever, whatever the issue may be, again, constantly educating them. Yeah, sure. And so it's been a little bit since I've stalked your website, Mm. but so you've got different levels of your service offering. Mm -hmm. Can you talk us through how did, how did you go about putting those together? Putting those and what they, and also what they are. I what suppose. they are. So three levels: um, get sorted, like a boss, and world domination. Nice. Uh, so get sorted is really for those those in their um, in their twenties, I'd say, uh, late twenties, early early thirties that really just want to set the foundation. Mm. Um, you know, they've never really thought about their finances before. They're starting to earn you know reasonable money, 60, 80, 100 k, and they're thinking, mm, actually, I probably need to start thinking about this rather than wasting it all. Mm. Um, then you've kind of moved into the, the Like a Boss program. So that's typically for those that maybe have a small portfolio of shares or they've bought their first investment property um, or, you know, their income starting to kind of tick up into that, you know, that higher income bracket. And they've, you know, they've probably got a little bit more complexity 
in their space and there's much more accountability with the like of us program as well um, so we have um, progress meetings with our clients every 12 to 12 to 16 weeks with the with the with the like of us program and then there's world domination and if i'm honest we we don't have many clients in the world domination um, program and yep. that's because it's really for those that have quite complex financial structures companies trust self-managed super funds and things like that really the way that it's it's it's, it's kind of evolved is that the client chooses which one they feel is, is is right for them and then it's almost like they move through the programs as they move through kind of different stages in life yep. uh, starting off with get sorted then they kind of want to ramp it up a little bit a uh, little bit more like a boss and then Finally, the world domination phase. <laughs> nice. And have they changed? Have your packages changed in the 18 months since you started your business? Uh, the programs themselves have evolved, definitely, but haven't had kind of seismic changes. We have made some changing to, to pricing and mm -hmm. making sure that that's where it needs to be. Yep. Um, and that has evolved. But broadly, it's been more kind of iterations on what we had initially built. Okay, and what so what is include so the um, get sorted? What's what's covered in that? So it's <laughs> so the get sorted and the like a boss program, or really all programs. It is looking at every facet. Yeah. <clears throat> Of their financial, whether whether it's you know tax minimization, cash flow, super insurances, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. um, with the get sort of program, though, because um, again their financial world probably isn't as complex, um, so it is an annual progress meeting. So we don't refer to them as reviews; they're, they're progress meetings in, in yeah. our world. Um, but in saying that, we internally have. Um, uh, kind of diarised for to reach out to these specific clients uh, at specific, you know, each each quarter. So the client doesn't know that, that, that that's kind of a review, but it's, it's almost seen as kind of a random reach out. Um, but we do work in the background to kind of give them a call and then say, hey, I wanted to give you an update on this, 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 and this. Yeah. Um, and these are the things that we've kind of been thinking about uh, and kind of Keep, um, you know, guiding the conversation from there. The Like a Boss program, like I said, there's, there's much more face-to-face -face interaction with that, that 12 to 16 week um, progress meeting kind of turnaround. Um, but also we do, we've just started, um, so we're using My Prosperity, mm. uh, which, oh, yeah. is, which is something that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure many of the listeners kind of have, have played with or considered. Yeah. Um, and now we're starting to reach out to our clients off the back of those automated emails. So, for an example, we can set goals within those um, within those within that platform. You know, I need to save ten thousand dollars for a holiday, or whatever the case may be. Um, and they'll get an automated email on a monthly basis through the program as to whether they're on or off track. Um, and Kat in our team, if they're off track, she'll send them an email saying, "Hey, is there anything that we need to do? Noticed you're off track." Um, if they're off track for for, for kind of two months uh, in a row. A task where we Netflix to Jess and I to say, "Hey, what's going on? You know, mm. what, something must be happening with regards to the cash flow kind of piece." Right. Um, so we're we're trying to be much more proactive in terms of our approach rather than just catching up with someone and saying, "Hey, this is what happened for the last year," and then catching up with them again and saying, "Hey, this is what happened for the last year." It's more around saying, "Hey, notice you've been off track for the last you know four weeks or so. Let's not wait a year to talk about it. Let's let's have a conversation now as to why that may." Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I know that's something that I found when working with clients. You follow this typical sort of the annual review type uh, service offering or we were doing with some of our clients doing a six-monthly review and it's just so easy for people to get off track. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, I found that the increasing the frequency of those contacts really keeps keeps people in line and uh, ultimately if they're, you know, if they're going to be a client of yours, you want to make sure they're getting results because if they, you know, one, it's, it's great, obviously, you're helping them. But from a business perspective, no one's going to keep being a client if they're not getting results for, for mm -hmm. an extended period of time. Totally. There's no point, no point uh, going there in the first place. So, yeah, cool. And so I think another thing that you, it sounds like you've got your services very nailed down. For me as well, one of the things that I've found is that that allows you to drive a lot of efficiency in uh, the way that you work internally. Mm -hmm. And did I see Jess, uh, Jess smirking because... Um, because why, Jess? Um, because, okay, being very honest, let's be vulnerable, we hated our financial planning software when we launched and we were like, 
oh, it's really shit. Like we're not even. It's gonna, ugly. It's super <laughs> ugly. Yeah. We're not even. They gonna, are all pretty ugly. Yeah. Well, that's the problem. We, we weren't used to it. We're never used to buy software before. We yeah. Used, like Salesforce. Anyway, we had all this cool tech that was really beautiful, and we got advice software, and we're like, oh, this is so ugly. So you know. <laughs> infinite wisdom we didn't use it and we were like poo-pooing it a little bit and we just got ourselves into this massive jam where we were literally using like post-it notes like just so so shit and such a poor way to run a business and sadly i would suggest by the amount of times that we've actually broken the financial planning software i don't think many people actually use the financial planning software very much because if we as a tiny business have found so many things that actually need updating within the software because it doesn't work properly it blows my mind that big businesses mustn't have found these errors Mm. yet Mm. um so look glenn being the ocd king that he is very much adopted you know we basically got to a point where we realized probably q3 of last calendar year holy shit, like we cannot keep growing like we have mm. been and keep using post-it notes for so very many reasons, but clearly just not an efficient <laughs> Not the way. least of which, post-it notes are very expensive, which you yeah. figure out which you have to buy them yourself. Totally. They are so, so expensive. expensive. They do give them away at um, conferences. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Jess, Jess knows all the bag. people at 3M oh, now. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Wait, wait until they're in session is what I've found. All the tables are unattended. Yeah, oh, so expensive. And when yeah. you're a BDM, you just think those people are so funny. And now that I'm on the other side, I'm like, <laughs> five of these pens and three of these yeah. notepads. Anyway, um, so basically Glenn had to put down tools and basically work out how the hell to build the business in the back end to make it efficient. So, mm-hmm. you know, to, to take the risk off us, that the post-it note blew away, God help us if it was ever windy. Um, but also now that we had you know, new team members involved, we needed to be able to really segregate Mm. roles. And so it's been a huge, huge undertaking, but we are pretty embedded into our financial planning software in terms of efficiencies and workflows and Mm. tasks and threads and all the other fancy words for it. But, you know, our team knows exactly how much work's got to happen this week. We know how much everyone's got on their plates at any time. Mm. There's no, it's like, it's, it's, it's been a huge transformation for efficiency. Mm. And talking about, I suppose, bringing it back to kind of planning, um, we we focused, the, the mistake that we made mm. is that we focused on things that we really enjoyed and we were really good at. Mm. We yeah. knew how to sell. We knew the marketing. Mm. Um, loved we, people. We loved, pe- we mm. loved people. We loved the client experience piece. Mm. Um, you know, I joke that, you know, one day, uh, we caught up and we were even talking about where our office was going to be, what it was going to smell like and all of this kind of stuff. <laughs> well, you do have that fancy diffuser. Thing. We do. Right. It's Bushman. Yeah. Um, and, and we focused, focused on that stuff because we loved it mm-hmm. um, and we, we enjoyed doing it. Mm-hmm. We didn't focus on the actual right. back-end mm-hmm. process. Which is sort of like pretty important. Which it's is okay if super got, important. When you've got when you've got like a dozen clients and uh, then you've only got a dozen post notes, that's okay. But when you yeah. find yeah, when you've got more, the more clients you've got, the more you like you need to have good good back end foundations. It was just the unknown. We kind of almost didn't know where to start again because we'd just never written an SOA before. Mm. So if you are working in a big corporate or a bigger financial advice firm and you are planning on going out on your own, definitely think about client experience. Definitely understand what problems you're solving and who you want to work with. But for goodness sake, figure out your journey and don't just figure out customer experience journey. Work out what operations. You, yeah, what do you need to have happen at a business level f- to be able to fulfill because Glenn became like a little bit like Cruella de Vil at one point and like just a bit crazy because he's so structured and organised and it was shambolic in the background and yeah. now it's so structured. Mm. If you came into our business and had access to our software and you could read English, you would be able to do our processes because everything is documented. Mm. There's notes on how to do every note, every mm. task in the note. And the idea is that as our team does expand, they can literally read all of the task descriptions go to each task and they should really be able to follow their nose, which is yeah. pretty impressive turnaround in a short space of time. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks, Glenn. Good work, Glenn. Thanks. Yeah. I think I've found that I, I'm pretty process minded as well uh, myself and, and had the distinct advantage uh, on you two of having actually been a financial advisor <laughs> before and knowing when I started my business, what, 
what were the things that needed to happen to mm. behind the scenes mm. uh, to deliver the, you know, the all of the nice feelings as well. And and uh, yeah, it's been a journey. It's been a lot. I sort of geek out on that process piece, but I know now with team we've brought on a couple of people. Well, we've brought on three new team members in the last six months, and they walk in, especially the uh, especially we've got like a client success person, and then just this week started a, a person more on the admin side of that. Mm-hmm. Um, but they walk in and say, "Holy crap! Like uh, it's all, it's all just there, and it's got the notes, and there's a link to like a little video and the things, mm-hmm. and they can just sort of follow it through." So I think Amazing. that's uh, that's important, and plus it, it allows you to scale uh, without you meeting your client results, doing things quietly, and uh, able to manage things from a business perspective. I love though that you're that you're getting that visibility from a team level. I don't have that, so I'm mm-hmm. trying to figure out how I can get that. Mm. Yeah. So even uh, to, to 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 that point in our in our weekly meetings, we go through you know any tasks that are overdue, and the conversation is you know why why your tasks are overdue. It's more around oh is there is there capacity that we need to share with mm. the other with the rest of the team? Yeah. Um, you know is there is there and I'm constantly kind of speaking with, with with the team around you know is there anything that could be changed? Is there something that could be more efficient? Um, constantly kind of tweaking it. It's just really nice now that the foundation is there and it is it is just improving on, yeah. the, on the existing structure yeah. as opposed to um, really starting from scratch. Yeah, very good. Look out, world. So, look on uh, on the planning side of things. What is what is one thing that that uh, didn't work that you thought would didn't work that we thought would? Mm, that's a tough one. It's a good one. Hiring. Yeah. Yeah. We we made a false start with our first hire. Mm-hmm. And if I think about not only like for a variety of reasons, including us being really non specific about the role and stretching this person person way too much and not providing the right training and just really loose expectations. Like we thought that that would work and it really didn't and it really led to seismic change of how we hire new staff members but a very um a very sad and expensive lesson mm, for sure. sure yeah i find that the time the time that you spend is probably the most expensive part even though recruiters are expensive oh, and the, all the things that, that 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 just that amount of time at the start yeah, and it's a it's a nightmare to deal with yeah so. and, and it, i think it just comes down to the wrong hire for the particular role that we needed to fill correct more than anything else yeah, yeah. um so yeah Learning curve. Lesson. Mm. So the lesson is specific with your job specs. Hi for the role and with the values for your business. Yeah. Right. Awesome. And what's something that uh, that worked that you didn't think would work? I've got one. Um, Jess always gloats about this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the whole PR piece. Mm. So um, how many Facebook likes now? Not so social, but also, um, you know, um, trade magazines and things like that. We've been really fortunate in that, in that a lot of people have been interested in, I suppose, what we're doing because we are trying to really do something quite different. Um, and, uh, you know, a number of journalists and things have reached out to us. And I wasn't sure that that would actually result in any kind of clients. I was like, no one reads, you know, clients yeah. don't read, um, you know, financial advice uh, magazines. But something that, you know, um, I was proven wrong for was that although they might not read the magazine, they see on our website that we've been featured in this particular article mm. or this particular magazine or we've, we've kind of had an opinion about this particular um, issue. Uh, and it just, it's just created a lot of credi- uh, credibility mm. um, rather than us just saying what we do, having other people to tell 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 our mm. story has has created um, a lot of opportunity from a I guess a client acquisition standpoint. Mm. Awesome, yeah, I think that that trust is is so important. And totally. There's so many people out there in that space that as soon as you've got someone else talking about you, that's like that's like five five additional points in that like less crazy, not crazy, totally. time, right? Yeah. It's like the more you can get, it's like oh, there's three people that said about maybe they're maybe they're actually not crazy. So. Yeah. Mm. Do you have anything that's worked that you didn't think? Um, I think maybe one of the other things that's been really interesting for us is we've got charity partners 
that are really important to us, um, both personally and professionally. And, um, you know, they really speak to who we are as a business and what we care about. And it's just been really interesting that because we're really passionate about the, the charities that we've done stuff for, we just naturally want to help them succeed and thrive. And we actually have got really interesting opportunities from that that we didn't really go in yeah, to it true. from. You know, we, we, I really believe um, that all organisations have a role and a responsibility to give back, and I think that that's a really core fundamental belief of us as a business. And so we sat down and really thought about, you know, what is genuinely really important to us and let's find charities that align to that. Mm. And the intention was just to help them because we believe what they're doing is good. And even only this week, I went and spoke um, at a, at a um, event in Melbourne for a charity that we work with on financial literacy for women. And I'm super passionate about that. Mm. And it's so exciting that, you know, that charity who we've worked with since we basically started the business, you know, I'm now speaking on behalf of them to help um, women with financial literacy. So I think mm. that's probably something that yeah. has been really interesting. Yeah, awesome. And again, on the on the uh, you know building an identity for your business and authority in the market and yeah. that, that trust. Element. Yeah, and I think about you know more broadly beyond you know twelve months ago or nine months ago it was just Jess and I, um, but now you know the team has really embraced the charities. Yeah. Um, so we do, we've done kind of team fundraising. Um, our clients have embraced the charities mm. in that, um, you know, we hosted a, a workshop and put on breakfast and basically said, look, this breakfast would have cost you 10 bucks. We'd love for you to donate to, to one of these charities and um, we'll, we'll match what, 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 what you donate. Mm. Um, and then the third thing is our referral partners have embraced them. So we don't take referral fees from anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, the, a, a mortgage broker that we work quite closely with, he actually, if, if we refer um, his team a client and he writes the loan, he actually donates $500 to our charity of choice. Oh, great. Um, mm-hmm. So it's just really nice to see that it's it, it's now kind of a, it's a bit of an ecosystem around mm-hmm. kind of the fox and hare family. It's nice. Awesome. I love that. Mm-hmm. Cool. So, look, guys, I could uh, seriously, <laughs> if they brought in that lentil salad from outside, uh, I could uh, I could talk all day. But a few quick ones for you before we go. Mm. Um, biggest oops moment or stuff up? <laughs> biggest oops moment. Oh, God. You remember that time in the beginning where you thought you transferred? Oh, uh, yeah, that, that was that's really bad. Very bad. Probably like three months in, I like thought I transferred the client's money to the wrong account. I was like, oh, my God, I fucking lost the money. <laughs> 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 and <you did> but <laughs> I had not. Um, I didn't read my post note properly. And, and, and I, I did I actually, there was no problem at all. But um, Jess was very supportive. She's like, oh, it'll be fine. Um, <laughs> really screaming. Really cool kind of reflected. So that was, that was, I still remember that vividly. Um, have not done that again. <laughs> Very good. I don't have like a big um, size, like a big pointy one. Big, just the biggest. One. But like, I am not structured and not organised as a person, and I'm okay to say that because I'm very good at other things. Um, I think for me, my biggest one is actually just working in a really, like being a financial advisor is really structured and you have to be really organised and on top of everything. I kind of constantly am like, oops, 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 oops. So I'm having lots of little oopses, maybe then one big one. Right. Stay on track. Okay. Cool. So uh, one of the other questions is going to be how do you organise, how do you organise yourself, organise your day? Uh, so do, do client meetings. Yeah. So five days a week, including Saturday, Wednesday, I block out the entire day. I get in, um, at about six o'clock in the morning. Um, I go to the gym between kind of 12 and probably one thirty, Um, and then I work until probably about six or seven, depending on whether I've got client meetings. Um, and yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty structured. Don't typically most clients come to us, even prospects come to us to have coffee we're at a beautiful cafe um here in the office which is which is quite nice um yeah that's that's my broad structure mm. all i would add to that is i mean obviously we've got tasks so we come in every day and we've got a workflow that we work from um we do monthly team meetings we do weekly team meetings we do daily huddles to work out what everyone's priority is and if there's something that needs to be kind of shuffled or um kind of helped with we kind of muck in there so we've got quite a business cadence if you like so we know what stuff's coming we know what kpis we're talking about at a monthly level versus a weekly level glenn and i have a separate meeting to talk about clients and making sure that we understand who's coming on and what do we need to think about 
Um, you know, if I've got more clients than Glenn and I've got heaps of work, then Glenn will say, mm. cool, I'll take on all the new clients for the next little bit. So, you know, in terms of managing day to day, sure, but then we've kind of tried to take that up mm. a level as well. Yeah, also. so we have a uh, monthly director's meeting, mm -hmm. um, which goes for three or four hours. And then every three months, Jess and I catch up for a full day um, and, and really just focus on the business. And, and we block, if we, we have the session, we have the strategy day, and then we book in the next one. Because we know if we don't, it's, it's just not mm. going to happen. Mm. Um, and the next one is uh, the week after the AFA conference because we know we're going to go there. We're going to hear a whole lot of things that we might want to, to kind of take on board. So the following week, we've blocked out that day to go, okay, what are the key takeouts? What are the things that we need to change and pivot um, in order to kind of build on what we've already started? Awesome. Yeah. Love it. Um, favorite app or tech tool? Top spot. Had it down. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. HubSpot's amazing. Yeah. I was just, I'm sorry. I keep thinking of like app, like phone. No, HubSpot. HubSpot I'll, I'll agree. Okay. Mm. Uh, productivity hack. Productivity hack. I like for anything organized how you defer to, uh, <laughs> to <laughs> productivity <laughs> hack. I've yeah. got one. Do you do the, the shittest task first? Eat the, frog. To, eat, eat the frog. Yeah. Just do it. Get in before people start asking you questions. <laughs> so from about six till about eight thirty, about two and a half hours of pure bliss. Yeah. Just me, my meditation music on Spotify, and my uh, my diffuser going. <laughs> Don't harass me anymore. Love that. Yeah, it's good. I do that at home. I get up early uh, and then get cracking before I go to the gym. And get yeah. Up before the action happens. So yeah. Very good. Uh, what's your spirit animal? Mm. Um, mine would be a gorilla. Ooh. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I just like them because they're quite, uh, they're, they're really majestic and I feel like they're kind of the unsung hero of the jungle. It's not like a lion that's like really, really out there and there's absolutely nothing wrong with lions, but I just really like that they're, yeah, they're just, they're very family orientated and um, they just seem really love it. <laughs> They're probably really structured too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Organised with their nuts and their berries and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, mine's a horse. Oh. Yeah. I just think that they are strong and wild and beautiful and they can be on their own and they can be part of a group. <clears throat> what colour? Oh, my gosh. I haven't got down to the colour of my spirit arm. I'll go with red. Ginger. Yeah. Ginger. Let's go Ginger. chestnut. I think it's chestnut when <laughs> it's a horse. Let's go with right. the chestnut horse. Very good. Well, well, maybe we should have said fox and hare, but anyway, we probably should. Have. <laughs> yes. Well, Jess, Glenn, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And uh, yeah, we've got four more coming in this series on uh, setting up an awesome plan for your business. Cheers, Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Ooh.